So many home fragrance scents smell unnatural, super sweet, chemically, or maybe even like a part of the mall you can't wait to escape. And after learning that the candle industry contributes to an insurmountable amount of non-recyclable waste, carbon emissions, and toxicity in our air, I am so happy that Notes Candles exists. Notes Candles is on a mission to help eliminate single-use candle vessels and give home fragrance lovers a more earth-friendly option without giving up high-quality fragrance that actually seems amazing. I have been loving burning the Santal and Atlas Cedar scent. It's woodsy, calming, and smells so good. I can't get enough. I love it. And they have other amazing one-of-a-kind fragrances like oat milk and balsam berry, vanilla and pepperwood, and pistachio and rose water. Every single one of them is exceptional. Be a responsible consumer while not giving up high-quality home fragrance by making the switch to Notes. You can build your custom starter kit right now at notecandles.com slash best of you. Right now, Notes is giving listeners 15% off and free shipping when you buy a Notes starter kit using code best of you. Just use code best of you when placing your order. That's code best of you at notescandle.com slash best of you. Did you know that Organifi makes products for kids? They just launched their brand new kids product called Organifi Protect. This is a delicious wildberry punch that tastes just like Kool-Aid you used to have as a kid, but without the sugar. This delicious berry punch is crafted with the purest organic ingredients, including a potent combination to bolster your child's immune defenses. It's especially formulated for kids with no artificial ingredients and gentle enough for them to drink every day. If you already love Organifi, you can add Organifi Kids Protect into your regimen. Or if you're new to Organifi, check out their line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition and high-quality ingredients, helping you move from a depleted to nourished state. Head over to www.organifi.com slash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off your entire order. That's www.organifi.com slash best of you. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Allison, and I'm so glad you're here to discover what brings out the best of you. This podcast is all about breaking free from painful patterns, mending the past, and discovering our true selves in God. I can't wait to get started as we learn together how to become the best version of who we are with God's help. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Best of You podcast. I am thrilled to announce a new series. This series is so special. It is filled with such rich conversations with people whose work has profoundly impacted me and my own life, as well as so many other people. The series is called I Shouldn't Feel This Way. It's leading up to the launch of my brand new book by that name, I Shouldn't Feel This Way. It comes out May 7th. And in anticipation of the book releasing, what I wanted to do was to invite some of these really special people. These are people I've gotten to know. These are people whose work I greatly admire. And each one of their stories illustrates this theme of I shouldn't feel this way. They've each had to overcome that obstacle of feeling some way that they wish they didn't feel and to finally having to reconcile the fact that I do feel this way and now I've got to do something about it. And so I am so thrilled that each of these guests agreed to come on as a part of this series. We're going to talk about some of the top topics that you guys have again and again and again asked me to cover on this podcast So please make sure you're subscribed to the Best of You podcast. Wherever you get podcasts, just click that plus sign to subscribe so that you don't miss any one of these episodes. And if you haven't yet pre-ordered, I shouldn't feel this way. When you do, you will get the first three chapters of the book. So you'll have a better sense of the framework that we're going to be talking about with each of these guests. You can read those chapters now. You'll also get a guided journal to accompany the book as well as access to my masterclass, I Shouldn't Feel Stuck in My Head. We had the live masterclass this past week. Hundreds of you attended that masterclass. It was such a rich time. I heard from so many of you about it. So if you want access to the recording of that masterclass, you can still get it when you pre-order I Shouldn't Feel This Way. Just go to drallisoncook.com slash I Shouldn't Feel This Way, or you can go to I Shouldn't Feel This Way.com to claim those bonus items after you pre-order the book. In today's episode, I have invited Monique 
Coven. She's a new friend of mine. She's the host of the Healing Trauma Podcast. And many of you may already be familiar with the podcast. It's a great resource for anyone recovering from trauma. She has top experts in the field on the podcast, and she's recently introduced a faith focus to the podcast. And Monique's got a powerful story to share with us today about how she learned to name trauma and how learning to name it set her on a path toward healing. This is such a powerful episode for everyone. As you listen, listen for yourself, but also listen for your friends, for your loved ones who may be experiencing these symptoms that are in fact potentially signs of past trauma. It's so critical to name trauma correctly in order to heal it. So this episode is such important listening for every single one of us. My guest, Monique Coven, is a certified trauma recovery coach, and she's a survivor of childhood trauma. She's the host of the Healing Trauma podcast, which I can't recommend highly enough. Please enjoy my conversation with Monique Coven. Monique, I'm so thrilled to have you here. You are doing such beautiful work on the Healing Trauma Podcast with all the things that you offer people who are recovering from trauma. And I'm just thrilled to have this opportunity to get to know more of your story and what has inspired you to do the work that you do. As you and I have talked, I shouldn't feel this way. This new framework I have coming out is about this idea that so often the very first thing we become aware of when we have to dig into our own emotions is this inner guilt, this inner shame sometimes, this inner almost gaslighting that we do to ourselves, trying to get ourselves not to feel the way we feel. And I want to start there because you write so powerfully. And if it's okay, I want to read this. This is your words. You said, I could not wait until childhood was finally over and I could live free and away from the terror and dread that I experienced in my childhood and teenage years. It was only to realize that it felt like I had not really escaped my childhood after all. I did not understand this because everything on the outside appeared well. I had a career I loved, a beautiful family of my own, and a great community of friends. And I just read that and I thought, oh gosh, I'm imagining you maybe in your early to mid-20s thinking, I've got it, I've done it, I've escaped a really hard situation why do I feel the way I feel? Can you talk to us? Put us back in that moment in time. What was that like for you and what was going on inside of you? Yeah, you described it so well. You know, after we've experienced trauma, we are so happy to be away from it and to start fresh, to start new, to have that life that we dreamed of as children, you know, one of peace and calm and just happiness. And so for me, I had just gotten married. I mean, everything on the outside looked like things should be going really well. And it didn't make sense to me because my body was still feeling sensations, images. I was feeling a lot of hypervigilance. My husband would walk into a room and I'd jump to the ceiling almost. And it just didn't seem to make sense because on the outside, it was over. And here I have this new life, but yet my body was feeling... It was still feeling as if my body was waiting for what happened in the past to happen again. There was pretty significant both verbal and physical abuse in your childhood. Is that right? Yeah, there was was a lot. I had a disorganized attachment. So that means, in my case, a very frightening mother. And this was what I was supposed to attach to. And that was just the beginning, you know. So imagine you don't have that safe place. So there was that. And then there was just chronic, chronic chaos, lots and lots of marriages. And I was basically always feeling like I was fighting for my life. So very little safety, none of that secure attachment. So this is kind of what you're bringing into this marriage with a guy who he walks in the room, he hasn't harmed you. He hasn't hurt you. He's not scary. And yet your body is reacting to him in your early marriage as if he is one of these figures from your past. And I imagine that was very disorienting for you. And so at the time, how did you frame that for yourself? You know, how did you make sense of that? Or did you not know what to do with it? It wasn't just him. 
you know, there were really great parts of it. It was really the day-to-day, moment-to-moment life, meaning getting up in the morning, experiencing having your own apartment and the responsibilities of that, going to my work. I was a social worker, going to work. And the whole experience of it was one of feeling like I was in danger all the time. And that looked like you've got a lot of anxiety, girl. (laughs) Okay. And was there a sort of self-shaming component to that? What's wrong with me? Why can't you get it together? Was that part of it for you? A hundred percent. Because it didn't make sense, because I was physically away from my childhood, I was really, really upset with myself thinking, what is wrong with you? Look at your life. You have everything that you've wanted, and yet you're feeling so anxious. Yeah, I just, I feel that in my being when I hear you say that, because I think that is so common for people. In the absence of anyone helping us to understand and name what's happening, we tend to blame ourselves and get really hard on ourselves. When you were, in fact, the one, you know, your body was doing what it was conditioned to do. What happened, Monique, as you talked about it? Did you tell people? Who did you tell? And and how did that go, either positive or or negative? It might have made it worse sometimes. I remember when it was happening at the beginning, my first job, I'd be making lots of notes because I just thought it was so odd how I was feeling. And I didn't really talk about it a whole lot at the beginning. I guess I didn't trust that I could share it. But then later on, I started to talk about it and recognized, okay, I'm feeling a lot. I need to go for some help. I mean, as a social worker, I knew that there's help. And I, I started to see a variety of people therapist, doctor. And I was basically told that I have anxiety and, you know, I need to work on the anxiety. And the most effective approach for anxiety is cognitive behavioral therapy. So I need to work with someone who has that. And so I did that and that didn't seem to work. Found another, found another, tried another, did another, tried another. And I just, my body just wouldn't settle when I needed to, because often I would write when I was activated, right? Okay. I'm telling myself that, no, it's not, you know, you're supposed to write the truth of what's sort of happening. And well, I could write the truth, but my body's saying that's not the truth, (laughs) you know? So it's kind of like you're writing that you are safe, but your body is saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. How do you explain that when you yourself don't even have the words? You try, but they don't understand. And so I kept getting the feedback I kept getting back was, well, you need to just keep trying. You just, and I'd get this look. And of course, I would interpret that as, okay, I must be this client that's not complying, or I must be the one that just can't do it. It was really, really hard. Yeah, there is really a another traumatizing event there. When you go to get help and the help that is being offered you is actually not helping, but you feel responsible for that again. It even goes deeper than that because my trauma was actually related around not getting help. So you can imagine here I'm trying to get help because things are happening that feel like the past and I'm not getting help. I'm told some tell me just stay with it. I can share like a particular scenario that I brought, because this was really, to me, I could not understand it. So when I was a young mom, I would be exhausted. I had twins. I'd be exhausted at the end of the day. And sometimes I'd leave the dishes and pots for the next day. I'd wake up in the morning and, you know, I'd take my kids to preschool and I would come back and I said, you're going to do the dishes. You're going to, you know, put things away, make it organized. Whenever I would try to do that, my feet would essentially feel frozen on the floor. They wouldn't move. And I'd be like, why can't I do it? And I try and I try and I could feel my body get more and more activated. And then finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I'd grab my keys and I would run out the door. And I was like, what is that? And it happened every single day. And I'm like, I don't understand this. It makes no sense. Just do the stinking dishes, you know? I could not. And there was a feeling, a feeling of this feels familiar. And when I brought it to my doctor, she was saying, well, you really need to stay. You need to stay. When actually that was like the worst thing I could do. And so that's just an example of how trauma was showing up in my body. And I 
didn't know how to manage it. I didn't know what to do with it. And of course, I blamed myself. That is such a powerful example of your body reading a situation that it needed you to understand was real, even if it wasn't real in that moment, right? In that moment, you were safe, but it was almost as if your body was telling you, cueing you, but I have known unsafety in this situation in the past. Please listen to me. And so how did you figure that out, Monique? How did you start to recognize, no, no, I'm not crazy. My body isn't crazy. There's a memory here. Something has happened that was hard. And I don't know yet what it is. I get that it's not the current situation of the dishes, but something is going on. How did you start to honor that? That's just such a powerful story. Oh, my goodness. Well, like I said, it went on for quite a while. And uh, I remember asking friends, does this ever happen to you? And they'd look at me with blank faces. No. And oh, my goodness. Well, it started with recognizing that there's just, there's more to this. I've had trauma. And at the time, complex trauma was not recognized, childhood trauma. It was just PTSD. So from a one-time event or a war. And so I remember going to the doctor and, and of course, it wasn't recognized. That's why I was given a diagnosis of anxiety. Nothing about my childhood was ever even mentioned. And then one day I came across a book by Dr. Judith Herman, and she was the first person to actually define and bring up, hey, there's this other definition. It's not just PTSD. There's complex trauma that can involve childhood experiences that have been repetitive, and it can feel, your body can feel like you've been in a war, and it has lasting impacts. When I read that, I'm like, oh my God, oh my goodness. And I took that book to the doctor that I was telling you about and seeing. I said, I think I'm holding the book. I think I know what's going on. And she looked at me with such a blank face, didn't discuss it, and I guess I kind of, for the time, put it aside for a little time. And just as a note, I've had Dr. Judith Herman on my podcast last year, which was such an honor. But so then what happened was I started to see little peeps on the internet about complex trauma. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get diagnosed professionally. So I met with a psychiatrist and a psychologist that worked together that did all of the evaluations and it came back, complex trauma. Well, when I saw that paper, you can imagine I'm holding that that paper and it's like evidence. And I just said, okay, now I'm going to do something about this. And that just started the whole journey of going for the right type of help, the type that that is going to address complex trauma. And I started getting trained as a complex uh, trauma recovery coach, certified coach. And yeah, my life just took off at that time. Man, this is just so powerful. There's so many different directions I can take there. I notice in my body feeling really angry about the care that you got at the time I came up. I think we're probably roughly the same age and and I know exactly what you mean. Everything pointed to cognitive behavioral therapy, which for the listener, it can be a helpful modality when it's correctly prescribed. It's about looking at your thoughts and aligning your thoughts more with reality But the problem with trauma, and we'll get into this, is that you can have all the rationality in the world. You can be thinking rationally, but your body, your nervous system hasn't gotten that message. Your nervous system is still living in the war, and there's no amount of logic or rationality that can get that message down into your body. And so we know this now, but at the time, it just listening to you breaks my heart for a whole generation, generations of people who were told there's something wrong with you. You're the problem. You're crazy. And and even to hear you, your face light up when you got the complex trauma diagnosis, there was freedom in that. That brought you freedom and clarity. I'm not crazy. There's a reason that my body is behaving in the way it behaved. I mean, the resilience in that, the agency in that, Monique, that you had to advocate for yourself, that's remarkable. I wonder now, as you think back to that younger version of you, And what she had to do to get to that point of, no, no, I'm not crazy here. That's heroic. Thank you. I guess there was always a part that was like, I'm going to do something about it. 
And I think one of the first things I did when I got that diagnosis is pretty soon after I started the podcast, I didn't know what I was doing. I was talking in my phone. But one thing I knew for sure is that if I've experienced this, there are so many who are going through that. And I just, I felt I had to do something to to help bring a little bit of light, a little bit of education so that they would know, no, no, you're not crazy. This makes sense. I'm always looking for ways to make drinking water easier so I don't even have to think about it. We know how good water is for our bodies. That's why you've got to check out AquaTrue. AquaTrue purifiers use a four-stage reverse osmosis purification process. It removes 15 times more contaminants than ordinary pitcher filters, and they're specifically designed to combat chemicals like PFAs in your water supply. What I love about AquaTrue is that one set of filters from their classic purifier makes about 4,500 bottles of water. That's less than three cents a bottle. Plus, you save the environment from tons of plastic waste, and it's super easy to set up and install. AquaTrue comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and even makes a great gift. Today, my listeners receive 20% off any AquaTrue purifier. Just go to AquaTrue.com. That's A-Q-U-A-T-R-U.com and enter code BESTOFYOU at checkout. That's 20% off any AquaTrue water purifier when you go to AquaTrue.com and use promo code B-E-S-T-O-F-Y-O-U. Our dogs love Sundays. I'm not kidding. One of our dogs was the slowest eater on earth for the first several years of her life. It was painful how long it would take her to eat. The minute we introduced her to Sundays, she just laps it up. She loves it. Sundays is healthy dog food that's easy to store and serve. Most foods are one or the other, but Sundays is both. It's fresh dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients that contains 90% meat, 10% superfoods, and 0% synthetic nutrients. But unlike other fresh dog food, it doesn't require refrigeration or preparation. It's air-dried, so you simply pour and serve. It's so easy. Get 40% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash bestofyou or use code bestofyou at checkout. So, Monique, you get this diagnosis, and I imagine you're sort of replaying the tape on all the years of getting really bad help and bad advice. So tell me a little bit about that. What was that like for you? There was a period where I was angry. <laughs> I was angry. I had to process that. But I, I know for years, for years, I contemplated, I want to go back to that doctor, the one when I brought in the book, <laughs> you know, and I kept like, I've even called a couple of times. Is she still there? <laughs> and I wanted to say, hey, And just voice that out and say, you know, all this time that I came and I, you know, you said it was anxiety. Well, it wasn't, you know, and I was upset about that. And I wanted to also say, and the therapy you recommended, I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work, (laughs) you know, and I wanted to talk about that. And then, of course, we can talk about the faith community because that too, there was some some hurt around also not being trauma-informed, which I get it. If the therapist can't even be trauma-informed, how can we expect the faith community to have that understanding? So there was, I was angry for a while. Yeah, I hear that. And how did you honor that anger? I mean, I hear justifiably you were angry. Yeah. I think I allowed it because it wasn't destructive. It wasn't an interference. I thought it was a healthy anger. That's what it felt to me like anyway. So that felt good. It felt powerful. There was empowerment there. There was justice for that girl. Because I remembered like, hey, she didn't get help. And then again, she didn't get help. So yeah, some of that. I love that. I do think anger is very empowering. It's forward moving. It's like, okay, now, now I can see the truth. I love that justice orientation. So that became a resource to you in a way, that anger. I love that. I think that's important for people to hear. There was a constructive nature to it. You had seen something that other people weren't seeing. And I love that you channeled that anger in many ways into, I'm going to start advocating for other people to get this message start the podcast, get this word out about the truth about trauma to other people. And it's a slow, slow process because I find the church community has changed. They're much more open to mental health now over the years, but there still needs to be that real understanding of what happens when we've experienced trauma, how it's not just the mind and that just quoting scriptures is not going to change 
a nervous system that's in dysregulation that is, you know, overwhelmed because it has experienced chronic trauma. And these are some of the symptoms. It's interesting, Monique, because you were both part of the therapeutic community as a social worker and you'd been let down by that community. As a person of faith, you'd been let down by faith communities. So talk to me a little bit about your faith. Were you able to kind of keep your understanding of God separate from how you'd felt let down by faith communities? I was. I was. I was really able to separate the people, even though some people said some things that really could be very hurtful, some spiritualizing. But I knew, I mean, I've shared with you before, I had a a really beautiful experience with God and in my early 20s. And I knew He was real, and I knew He was for me, and I knew He was going to help me. And I just clung to that. He was the safest place that I knew. So it wasn't the church itself. It was God Himself was the safest parent person for me. Both Monique and I talk about these experiences we had early on with God on your podcast, on the Healing Trauma Podcast. We'll link to that in the show notes. But I love what you're saying. There was a secure attachment with God that held you through even some of your disappointments with the church. Anything else, Monique, that you want to share about that period of time of kind of wrestling and coming to terms with the reality of your CPTSD? Well, I think what really helped and even started to provide a sense of compassion for my own experience was when I did some training, some professional training with Deb Dana with the polyvagal theory. And that rocked my world big time. It just changed everything because I really got an understanding of what is happening, what is going on, and how much our bodies make sense, our responses make sense. And some of the time in the past when I would have these uh, triggers or responses, I would get upset because it didn't make sense. But when I learned about how it does, you know, how our bodies are always looking, you know, underneath awareness, looking and evaluating whether we are safe or whether we're in danger. And because it's happening below awareness, that makes sense. That's why I would walk into a room not thinking anything, but suddenly feeling maybe this powerful feeling inside me that wasn't coming from my mind. It was coming from a cue my body picked up that may have reminded my body in the past something similar, and I was experiencing it in the present. That brought a lot of compassion. Wow. Would you be willing, if you're willing, to walk us through that instance of your freeze response in the kitchen with the dishes based on what you know now about the body and about polyvagal theory? Sure. What was actually happening there now that you understand it? Absolutely. So it's so interesting, you know, our brains, and you know this, you know, they're connectors. I was saying uh, on uh, one of my episodes how I've seen this in, in real action once we were driving in Myrtle Beach. And as I was driving, I heard my brain and my brain was saying, oh, this town is like that town. That's what we're talking about. That's what brains do. This is like that, or this is similar to that. And so in my kitchen, I would walk in and there would be pots and pans and, you know, all kinds of things. And I've had a lot of trauma, repetitive, sometimes in the kitchen, chaos, complete chaos. And for some reason, my brain made a connection. What happened to me over and over again, and sometimes it was in the kitchen, there was chaos, there was so much disorder and craziness. And I always wanted to run, but often I was stuck. And so it looked at the dishes and the pots and pans that didn't quite fit into the, they were overflowing onto the, and in your, you know, your first instinct is it's pots and pans for crying out loud. But to the brain, to my body, it was a reminder, even if it's just a sliver of truth, a sliver of connection, a sliver of a reminder, that's what it did. And I did the right thing. I got out of there. I grabbed those keys because I couldn't do that when I was younger. I was stuck. I was frozen. But this time, I grabbed those keys and I ran. And I did that so many times. That is such a beautiful example of this. Sometimes we call it the work of reparenting, where at the time that it was happening, it was probably still somewhat semi-conscious. You couldn't have pieced together all the dots. But I could also imagine, I don't know if you actually did this, 
as you're walking yourself through that to gently become aware of this freeze response makes sense and watch us leave the room. Watch that now, young little part of me, I think of the parts model here, watch that right now I actually have the agency and we can leave. We can leave, right? And as you allow that younger part of you to recognize, oh no, now you have an adult in the room who really loves you and who will care for you and who will get you to safety, that part of you is over time going to become more open to the idea that, okay, these are just pots and pans, right? Right. But you first have to connect with the part. And it, it so reminds me of the work of parenting our own children, right? We first have to connect with them. They're scared of something. They're scared of the dark closet. They're scared of the cobwebs. And we're not sitting there saying to them, you shouldn't be scared of that. That's dumb. We're saying, let me come with you into that fear. Let me explore that dark closet with you. Let me show you that you have what it takes. You know, we connect first. And that's exactly what your body needed in that moment is not for you to shame it, but to go, yeah, I get it. That's just beautiful. Yeah. And so you can imagine when I was told, you really need to stay in it. (laughs) It It's like, that's a Mm re-traumatizing. Yeah. 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 But my body knew better. My body knew to get out. Yeah. And as much as parts of you were taking in the bad information, parts of you were like, "Uh uh-uh, no, no, I'm going to keep fighting for myself. And you did. Mm -hmm. And you did. And you got yourself to better information. Yeah. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run, take a nap, read a book, maybe just spend some time hanging out with a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? Well, therapy can help you find out what matters to you so you can do more of it. We can't get more time in our day, but we can be intentional about figuring out what matters most. Therapy can help you figure out how to prioritize the people that mean the most of you, the activities that actually make you come alive, and the purposeful things you want to achieve. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash best of you today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash best of you. Tell us a little bit, what were some of the next steps you took? You finally understood this is what's happening. So then how do you begin to heal? Because obviously that naming, the accurate naming is huge. It's huge to unlock the beginning of the healing journey, but you still have to go through the journey. And as you began to kind of put the pieces together, were there daily practices even just that began to help you really heal your body and just honor the signals in a new way? Yeah, definitely. The thing with healing from trauma is that it's it's work. It's not just going to be time and it's not just going to be you know, once a week therapy and that's it. It's it's really because we have this nervous system that has been shaped from very early towards self-protection and towards looking for those things that are potentially threatening. And again, that happens below awareness. Then we need to make a conscious effort to help our bodies to see that there is still good in the world, in our lives, and to look for those things and also to practice those things. So one of the practices that I that I do is I have, you can call it a gratitude journal, but it's a little bit more than that. I write down things throughout the day that give me a little, a little taste of goodness. And I don't just write it because that's going to stay in my cognitive mind and it's not going to do very much. It's going to stay there and then go away. (laughs) But what I do, because I'm trying to help my nervous system really get a feel that things are different and that there's goodness, is that if I notice, for example, okay, this is just, I really like this. I picked it on purpose. This is a big glass of water and it's um, pink with flowers. It makes me happy. So I would look at that cup and and feel the joy of like why I chose it and how I feel inside. And I would savor that for a couple of 
seconds. So that's the idea of taking in like the savoring just for a bit, put it down and doing that throughout the day. So if I'm walking, you know, in the past, I might walk with earphones. I really don't anymore because I'm trying to take in the goodness. So I'll look around and I'll stop for a second, take it in what that bird feels like in my body, what the sun, the air feels like in my body. And yeah, so that's what I do. I love that. It reminds me, I I think it's Deb Dana's term of glimmers. Yeah. Which are the opposite of triggers. And you're being intentional about noticing the glimmers. Glimmers are when our nervous system is calm, clear. It's in that good place. You keep using the word goodness, which I love. It's the fruit of the spirit. And so it's almost like you're training yourself again in that reparenting idea. You imagine with a young child how we we want our children to bask in the goodness. Yeah, and it's yeah. like almost like you're teaching yourself how to do that. I love that. Yes, yes. And you know what's so interesting? I absolutely love Ann Voskamp. She knows it, <laughs> but who doesn't? But what's so interesting was that when I was learning about like the training I did for the polyvagal theory and learning about glimmers, I'm like, this sounds a lot like Anne's work because Anne was writing a list of God's graces. And for me, as someone who loves God, I thought, yes, I'm going to see these things through the lens of God's gifts and God's goodness. And that just was so powerful to me because like she says, it shows us the ways that God loves us. So we get that sense that He's still active in our lives every moment. And it's the little things. It really, really is. I think you're referencing a thousand gifts, which you're so right. That's exactly what she was doing. I love what you're saying, Monique. And I kind of want to just pause here for a second and linger because so often when we're talking about trauma and we're talking about the activation, and it's so important to honor that. And what I love about what you're saying is it's it's the both and. Yes. You're both trying to honor what's hard and not shame yourself for the times of activation. And simultaneously, you're trying to also teach your body about what's good, what is safe, what is beautiful, what is good about God, right? It's the wholeness. It's the integration. It's not all one thing, but it is both. Yeah. It's so interesting that you say that because that's exactly what I was thinking about before our conversation about the both and, because sometimes with just, you know, our upbringing, it's black and white, things are horrible and then there may be good. And this idea, what we want to just see is that it is a both and. We can have some symptoms that are uncomfortable and we can have some goodness in our lives. We can have both and we can hold both. That's incredible. That's a really powerful testimony, for lack of a better word, in the sense of the healing. Healing, I, I love to think of, we talk on the podcast about salvation has its roots in the word sozo, which actually means heal. It's really about the process of healing. And I hear you honoring God didn't minimize what was hard for you and also the goodness that you taste is almost that much more beautiful for having honored what was hard. Yes. And since this journey, I've been able to really like slow down and see things that I probably in my hyper vigilance didn't even see. And so that's the other piece is that a lot of survivors have difficulty staying in the moment because their bodies are used to, to being just ready for the next thing. And, you know, this idea of coming back into the land of the living, the land of the living, I just think that's just so beautiful and so hopeful. That's beautiful. What would you say to that younger 20-something you now? I would probably, well, first I would just tell her that I love her and that she is precious and beloved and that there's going to be hard things, but that it's going to be okay. That's beautiful. She is lucky to have you. What would you say to the listener who is maybe just realizing there's been trauma or who is healing from trauma? What would you want the listener to know? You know, the very first thing that comes right out of my mouth, because I believe this with all of my heart, I feel like it's something that's been stolen. And that is that, like, I really want them to hear this truth I'm about to say. And that is that you are so beloved. You're beloved. You're beloved. That's what you're made of. And then I would say that it is possible to find joy, to experience moments of peace, fun, 
safe relationships, community, and that there is always hope. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. How can people find you, Monique? You're doing such good work in the in the world, bringing that hope to so many people. How can people find you? They can find me at, my website is The Healing Trauma Podcast. And you can also listen to The Healing Trauma Podcast on any platform. If you sign up with Spotify, you will have some bonus and extended episodes, but that's how you'll find me. Yeah, I highly recommend. I did an episode with you for the podcast that was just really incredible. You do a really great job. You've got some great people on there. You have faith focus, but you bring in people from all sorts of experts to talk about different angles about trauma. It's really beautiful. Well, the faith component just started this past January. I'm really excited about that. So if you look at it, you might see some, you know, I've, I've had a lot of well-known people on there, but now we're taking a little focus on trauma, healing, and faith. Beautiful. One final question. What's bringing out the best of you right now? Oh, I want to say the first thing that comes to my mind is my little dog that's sitting right next to me. Oh, I love that. (laughs) I love him so much. He's just such a joy. I kiss him a million times a day. I'm going to have to say that, but just don't tell my husband or kids that I said that. (laughs) Honestly, I I sometimes I have two and uh, they just bring so much joy. Talk about that joyful goodness. Yes. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much, Monique, for sharing your story, for being here and for taking your hard story and turning it into these healing resources for so many people. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of The Best of You. It would mean so much if you take a moment to subscribe. You can go to Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to podcasts and click the plus or follow button. That will ensure you don't miss an episode and it helps get the word out to others. While you're there, I'd love it if you leave your five-star review. I look forward to seeing you back here next Thursday. And remember, as you become the best of who you are, you honor God, you heal others, and you stay true to your God-given self.